Hi! Welcome to my video essay on the significance of clothing and nakedness in chapter 1 of William Golding's novel Lord of the Flies. This topic is quite important. If you look at it closely, it might considerably shift your perspective on the central subject of civilization versus savagery. Even more importantly, understanding how the motive of clothing is used in the very first chapter is key to understanding lots and lots of symbols in later chapters, in particular skin, sunlight and shadows, heat and wind, various animal metaphors, dirt and washing, face paint, the hunter's black caps, Jack's hunting knife and more. Don't worry, this essay won't attempt to cover all these topics. But without the basic analysis presented here, you are unlikely to fully understand any of those later motives. This essay is a bit longer than most single topic analysis you may be used to on YouTube. So it's also an experiment to gauge whether there is interest for in-depth analysis that is not only providing a first overview, but paying close attention to the finer details of the text. When coming down to the beach for the first time, the very first thing Ralph does is to strip completely naked, without even having formed the intention yet to take a bath. For a 12-year-old middle-class British schoolboy in the 1950s, that's an amazing thing to do, in particular given that another boy is around, whom he has never met before and whom he apparently doesn't like much on their first encounter. Even more surprisingly, when the other boy emerges from the forest a few seconds later, still fully dressed and sees Ralph naked, there is no reaction whatsoever, not even a giggle or any remark. The first thing the other boy says is merely a casual apology for coming late. It is still harder to believe that, when about thirty schoolboys gather for an almost formal meeting shortly afterwards, Citation, some who are naked and carrying their clothes, others half naked or more or less dressed in school uniforms. During such meetings we will see quite a bit of giggling and joking about various subjects at the expense of various victims, but nobody ever mocks or mentions or even alludes to anybody else's nakedness. Nobody even notices anything strange about a group of choir boys wearing nothing but long black cloaks with a silver cross on their left breast, black caps, hem-bone frills around their necks and, maybe or maybe not, some underpants, most of them carrying their shorts and shirts in their hands. You should really try to imagine how that might look like, in front of an assembly of boys partly naked partly in school uniforms. In general, Golding very artfully depicts how the characters of his boys slowly develop throughout the story and he pays a great deal of attention to make it all believable and consistent, in particular taking the cultural background into account, but not so with respect to clothing, not at all. Even a decade later, when Peter Brook turned his film, being in general quite faithful to the book, such behavior was so unthinkable that in the film, Ralph wears his underpants even when going for a swim. Similarly, during the first meeting in the film, all the boys are fully dressed. I guess that Brooke feared being accused of pornography if he would have started the film with such blatant and apparently gratuitous nudity, and also that the indignation of the audience would have caused a serious distraction from the important aspects the director intended to show in these scenes. Note that this is one of the very rare details in which the later film by Harry Hook stays slightly closer to the original maybe because attitudes towards nudity had considerably relaxed during those thirty years. But even in 1990, none of the children attending the assemblies are completely naked either. If such completely implausible behavior occurs in an otherwise mostly realistic novel, there must be some deeper significance. 
And indeed, even though most commentators do not mention just how implausible this behavior is, most do offer an interpretation, usually along the following lines. Being separated from the adult world, they say, the boys gradually descend from civilization into savagery. It is a symbol for this descent that in the course of the novel they dress less and less. In the end they are going almost naked and becoming completely wild. Some commentators give this very argument a religious twist. The island is like the Garden of Eden, and casting away their clothes symbolizes the fall from decency into sin. Other commentators refer to the same Christian imagery, but come to just the opposite conclusion. The island is like the Garden of Eden, and the children can go naked because of their primordial innocence. They only lose their innocence when sacrificing to the beast, to the snake. However, these standard interpretations don't work at all. They are manifestly inconsistent with what is said in the text. First, it is true that the descent of the initially quite normal schoolboys into brutality is gradual and takes a long time. Piggy is first ignored, then bullied, then beaten, then robbed of his glasses, and finally murdered. The hunting only starts in chapter 3. The first pig isn't killed until chapter 4. Brutality of the hunting increases in multiple steps, Simon's murder is still in part explained away as an accident, and hunting only openly becomes manhunt at the very end. Even the symbols are introduced gradually. Painted faces first appear in chapter 4, the Lord of the Flies is set up in chapter 8, and the cry of the hunters isn't heard until chapter 12. In contrast to such gradual escalations, stripping naked in public is among the very first things Ralph does in chapter 1, yet he will never fully descend into inhumanity. Jack will fall, but he always wears his shorts. During the first meeting several children are completely naked, but none dance around any fires, brandish any spears, or kill any pigs or kids. So loss of clothing cannot possibly be a symbol of descent into savagery, or at least that cannot be the main point. On the other hand, nakedness cannot mean innocence either. In the first chapter, Ralph does several mean things. He refuses to ask Piggy for his name and just walks away when Piggy desires to speak to him. At that time he is still fully dressed. He insults Piggy by making fun of his illness, at that point being completely naked. My auntie wouldn't let me counter my asthma. Sucks to your asthma. He betrays his friend by asking the others to call him Piggy, having dressed again before that. Ralph is also capable of more kindly behavior. He shows some interest in Piggy by asking him about his family while naked and he later regrets his betrayal of revealing his nickname of Piggy and apologizes for it, while again dressed. So clothing doesn't appear to have any effect on Ralph's moral behavior. During the meeting, Golding profits of the opportunity to introduce several of the boys and provide some initial clues to their characters usually also mentioning some aspects of their outward appearance that seem to have some symbolic significance. Even though it is said that some of the boys are naked and some are dressed, Golding doesn't bother to mention who is naked. Apparently that doesn't matter to understand the character and morality of the individual boys. So, if nakedness neither signifies savagery nor innocence, what does it signify? The key to the answer is so close to the surface that I suspect most commentators unconsciously shy away from realizing it for fear of seeming trivial. When Ralph takes off his sweater, he does so simply because of the heat, because he is sweating while scrambling through the jungle. With less clothing, he is more comfortable and better adapted to the nature around him. Of course, that isn't the end of the story, there is indeed deeper significance, but the key is as simple as that.
To understand the deeper significance, let's look at why Ralph and Piggy get undressed, what they do and how they feel right afterwards, and why they put some clothes back on. When Ralph comes down to the beach, he sees the green palms, the shimmering water, the surf on the coral reef, the blue lagoon, the seemingly infinite beach. There are also traces of decay and havoc, fallen trunks, decaying coconuts and the scar of the plain. But Ralph doesn't have eyes for any of that. He only sees the beautiful nature, the dreamlike setting. He jumped down from the terrace. The sand was thick over his black shoes and the heat hit him. He became conscious of the weight of clothes, kicked off his shoes fiercely and ripped off each stocking with its elastic garter in a single movement. Then he leapt back on the terrace, pulled off his shirt and stood there among the skull-like coconuts with green shadows from the palms and the forest sliding over his skin. He undid the snake clasp of his belt, lugged off his shorts and pants, and stood there naked, looking at the dazzling beach and the water. He patted the palm trunk softly and, forced at last to believe in the reality of the island, laughed delightedly again and stood on his head. He turned neatly onto his feet, jumped down to the beach, knelt and swept a double armful of sand against his chest. Then he sat back and looked at the water with bright, excited eyes. As long as he is dressed, clothes seem a burden, nature is still menacing, heat, skulls, shadows, and his clothes make him act almost violently. As soon as he is naked, he feels free of care, joyful, almost tender and in tune with nature touching the tree, the sand, and later the water with his whole body, enjoying even the heat. Piggy is much less impetuous and emotional than Ralph, and he doesn't get undressed until he has a rational reason to. But when he finally decides to have a bath, the essence of his experience is strikingly similar to Ralph's. Piggy was looking determined and began to take off his shorts. Presently he was palely and fatly naked. He tiptoed down the sandy side of the pool and sat there up to his neck in water, smiling proudly at Ralph. That may arguably be Piggy's happiest moment in Chapter 1. In any case, getting undressed eases his worries, brings him closer to nature and makes him quite comfortable, very similar to what happens to Ralph. Given that both of them feel so good, what makes them put on clothes again? They are all dead, said Piggy, and this is an island. Nobody don't know we are here. Your dad don't know. Nobody don't know. His lips quivered and the spectacles were dimmed with mist. We may stay here till we die. With that word, the heat seemed to increase till it became a threatening weight and the lagoon attacked them with a blinding effulgence. I will get my clothes, muttered Ralph along there. He trotted through the sand, enduring the sun's enmity, crossed the platform and found his scattered clothes. To put on a grey shirt once more was strangely pleasing. Then he climbed the edge of the platform and sat in the green shade on a convenient trunk. Piggy hauled himself up, carrying most of his clothes under his arms. So, just as casting away their clothes drives away their burdens and opens their minds to nature, joy and play, the return of worries lets everything seem menacing again, even nature, even the heat of the sun and the light reflected from the water. In that mood, clothing appears to provide some protection. Even though Piggy understands the plight of the world more precisely, Ralph is more deeply troubled by it badly needing the shelter offered by his clothes and by the shade of the trees, while partial dressing is already sufficient to restore Piggy's composure, even before he reaches the shade of the trees. Note that the nature and extent of the protection offered by clothing is explicitly left unstated at this point. 
The shirt is grey, a colour reappearing soon afterwards in Jack's shorts, which seems to deliberately avoid both positive and negative connotations, but might rather indicate something mixed, ambiguous, multifaceted. Similarly, it feels strangely pleasing, which sounds both comforting and disquieting, both positive and negative, but neither side of the effect on Ralph's mind is explained any farther at this point. So, while the first chapter already allows the analysis of most aspects of nudity, information from later chapters will be required to fully understand clothing. But uh, let's not digress in that direction right now. The same idea of clothing as a means of hiding from fear and anxiety is seen in the first small child coming to the platform. A child appeared among the palms, about a hundred yards along the beach. He was a boy of perhaps six years, sturdy and fair, his clothes torn, his face covered with a sticky mess of fruit. His trousers had been lowered for an obvious purpose and had only been pulled back halfway. He jumped off the palm terrace into the sand and his trousers fell about his ankles. He stepped out of them and trotted to the platform. The small boy squatted in front of Ralph, looking up brightly and vertically. As he received the reassurance of something purposeful being done, he began to look satisfied, and his only clean digit, a pink thumb, slid into his mouth. Since Ralph provides emotional security to Johnny, the little boy doesn't need the protection of his clothes. Given that nakedness is associated to naturalness, one might suspect that it could somehow be opposed to intelligence, but this is not the case. Ralph shows some intelligence in climbing a rock to decide whether he is on an island while still dressed, and remembers the result when naked, but he doesn't understand that the plane was shot down while dressed, and that his father cannot find out where he is while naked. Similarly, getting naked temporarily frees Piggy from care and makes him feel more comfortable, but it doesn't dim his wits. He still understands that Ralph's father cannot know where they are and that nobody will be able to tell him. It's time to pause for an instant and draw a preliminary conclusion. The symbolic content of nudity is purely positive. It is associated with naturalness, well-being and solace. It's not a cure-all, though. It doesn't affect neither morality nor intelligence, neither in any positive nor in any negative way. The symbolic content of clothing, on the other hand, is of ambiguous quality. It symbolizes both the burden and the terrifying problems of the modern world, as well as the shelter provided by civilization. Many commentators notice the various references to Genesis 3 that do indeed exist in the text, and speculations abound as to what they might mean. But you will have a hard time finding much evidence in the text that would support any of the various interpretations. In addition to the question of nudity and clothing, let's briefly look at two more examples. Piggy and Johnny eat fruit from the tree. Ralph and Jack do not. So the fruit doesn't appear to have any effect on morality. If anybody's being mean, it's Ralph and Jack, not Piggy. It's not the fruit giving Piggy knowledge. He was already intelligent before coming to the island. And Johnny doesn't exhibit any signs of exceptional enlightenment either. It seems almost like mockery that the only apparent effect of the fruit is Piggy's and Johnny's diarrhea. Similarly, Ralph's belt does feature a snake clasp, but what of it? Nowhere in the vicinity is anything to be found even vaguely related to temptation or intrigue. Ralph doesn't use the belt for anything but holding up his trousers, and it is never mentioned again, nor is any relation indicated to the snake thingies in the trees or to the beast. So at most you might say that the boy's clothing carries some mythical ballast that doesn't have any effect on the life of the island. In some way this is similar to what happens with the reference to Ballantyne's Coral Island. It appears as a cultural cliché, far from truth and usefulness, merely distracting the boys from what they should better worry about, except 
that the snake clasp isn't even noticed, doesn't even cause a distraction, except, maybe, for the unwary reader hallucinating deep biblical significance, while it's actually without any effect on the boys whatsoever. So I think what Golding is trying to say here is that what really matters is the inner state of the human mind. Reason versus reverie, naturalness versus anxiety, empathy versus callousness, and tenderness versus violence. While elaborate moral and religious systems existing in learned books outside the individual mind will likely turn out to be not all that relevant in the end of the day. What we found out so far is needed as a key to understand the various scenes that involve clothing later in the book, in particular regarding the significance of uniforms in chapters 2 and 12, for the magnificent scene on the beach when the ship passes by in chapter 4, for Ralph's thoughts when preparing his speech for the meeting after the fire went out at the beginning of chapter 5, for Ralph planning his toilet while he is hunting the beast in chapter 7, and for Jack's clothing when he founds the tribe and raids the fire in chapter 8. When reading such scenes, keep in mind that nudity is a positive symbol, representing naturalness, tenderness, peace, ease of mind and well-being, that it's opposed to violence, danger and fear, and that it has no association with innocence, nor with sin, nor with good or evil, nor with intelligence or insanity, nor with savagery. Also keep in mind that while clothing is associated with civilization, it is not a purely positive symbol, but refers to both positive and negative implications of modern society.